So, I am glad to be here. Thank you all for being here and be ready to hear from the Lord. Be ready for individually to hear from the Lord. We're living in such, as you all know, we can't say it enough. The days are very interesting. My goodness. But God, he's told us these days. He knows the end from the beginning, right, Dave? He does, absolutely. And so what he said in this word, he said, by the Holy Spirit, he'd show us things to come. Why? Because he loves us. As Mary Helen would say today, he just wants you to know what's going on because he's a good father. Now, like James was saying, his, his, his message on giving, is, it's not that God's a mean God. He's such a good, good God, but he created this earth. He created these bodies. He created his temples. And I know when my kids were little, and now I've got, since Robbie moved to heaven on us, you know, <laughs> but now I've got, you know, other younger sons, James and Ryan and Dave and Phil. Where'd Phil go? Okay, he's going to be in trouble now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Time out for Phil. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. But anyway, God is so good. And he shows us. So I used to, I wouldn't want my kids to play out in the street. So I'd say, don't play in the street. Why? Because I love them. If they play in the street, then they could get hurt. And I'm just going to hit the topic, the elephant in the room. There's so many protests against Roe versus Wade being overturned. These young, young girls think, oh no, we're not going to have any more rights. That's a lie of the devil. You know? And the thing is, I'm just going to be honest with you, if you do what the Word says, what your Creator says to do, and not have free sex with anybody you want, you don't have to worry about having a morning after pill. Because I don't care what you're doing. If you're doing it out of the will of God, then it's not that God doesn't punish you. What happens is he said, if you do this, if you do this, if you do this, if you uh, commit homosexual acts, judgments will come on you. He doesn't send it. You bring it on yourself. So like I told my brother, I said, if I started to take a little bit of arsenic every day, God wouldn't make me sick. I do it to myself. So whenever you walk out of the will of God, the reason why he tells you in his word what he likes and what he doesn't like, like the giving of the um, tithe, is because he loves you. And he wants you to be blessed. And he wants you to have a happy life and a peaceful life and a joyful life. And thus we can all testify, oh, they showed back up good boys. You know, you both are in trouble. <laughs> no excuse, no excuse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so anyway, we need to let these young people know it's fear. Satan is the author of fear. So, and God, the author of love, perfect love, casts out all fear. It's wonderful to live fear-free. Because there's perfect peace in there, isn't there? Right. Praise the Lord. Well, we're going to go. I really prayed. Of course, I always pray about this message. And because there's so much being said out there, I don't know how many of you follow Bible prophecy on, at, on any level. But there's a lot of... Um, the ministers out there saying we're right on the edge of Ezekiel, the wars of Ezekiel 38 and 39. And we're going to get a little bit in it. I'm not going to get into detail because you guys can go home. You can't just read those two chapters. It's something that has to be studied out. You know, they're, they're, they sound kind of, whoa. But when you really know how it's written, we're not going to get in the Hebrew, but you know the, um, the way it's written in the original language and everything else around it, it makes sense. And it's just God saying, judgments will come. And before we, there's other things, but I, you know the, well, I get ahead of myself. There's something that we know that in the Bible, God says he's just. And when he says something, he will fulfill it. But he says sin will bring judgments on you. But he gives you lots and lots of nations, lots and lots of, lots and lots and lots. He's patient and he's kind. Time to repent. But if you don't repent after a while, your sin gets so full and so full and so full and so full, then you bring the judgment on yourself. And that's what we're kind of seeing on some nations because we've had 2,000 years of the church being here and it's been broadcast. I mean, we're going to start out with some things in the word here. I wanted to say, a brother Hagen gave a quote that I love this quote. It's called, the word you rejoice over is the word that will work for you. You should remember that. You should write in your Bibles. The word you rejoice over, that's the word that will work for you. 
should rejoice with the whole word, the, all of it. Because even though some of it looks, if it looks scary, you don't know God. He's just. You rejoice over what he says, whether you understand it or not. If you've got a good parent, right, James? God is God. We, he, we can't bring him down on our level. We don't really understand, but he is love. Okay, another thing that Sharon and Eric got a couple of days ago, a word from the Lord, and I wrote it down because you need to get this in your, in your heart too. The word said to her, there is no excuse for not knowing the plan. It is written. And then God said, the details are up to me. So, so that's pretty heavy. She said it was so heavy and so real that she just said, oh God, we humble ourselves in front of you. There's no reason we shan't, can't know it. No excuse for not doing the plan. He wrote it. But leave the details up to him. Now, like we said in my class a while ago, we kind of went over this. We, we had Holy Ghost meetings up there, I believe. <laughs> we just keep preaching to each other. But God wants you to study the word and know what's written in here. And then you have to walk in the light that's revealed to you. You can't walk in the light of somebody else's attitude or lean on your own understanding. You have to bring it into yourself. And then whatever God reveals to you, you walk in that light. And you rejoice over that word. And then what will happen, you'll say, oh, good job, child. Let me show you some more. And you walk in that light. And you be a doer of that word. And you'll say, oh, good job, child. Let me give you some more. He reveals more and more and more of himself to you. And more and more of the plan to you. And as a senior in this studying the word of God, I still, well, we're all young in the Lord, but oh, it's worth it, isn't it, Larry? We were talking the other day, oh, what a blessing. If he would have gone the route that he was almost going to go. Ugh. But anyway, praise God, he obeyed the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> God sent me he's my my mission where no I'm teasing I'm his we are each other's in uh, 1 Corinthians 10 31 and 32 you know this one but it says therefore now this is we're going to look at the church the nations and the Jews there are three groups of people on the earth the church, the nations, and the Jews. And God has rule, he's got plans for all three different groups. And if you're a Jew, there's a plan there. If you're a nation, there's a plan there. But if you repent, you become a part of the church or if you ask Jesus into your heart. But there are plans for all of them. But he says to the church, that's to you and me. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Or you play your trumpet. Whether you speak beyond a pulpit, whether you are on a radio station, wherever you do, you've got to get this in your heart. You are responsible to do it unto the glory of the Lord because you're his ambassador and you're representing him. And he wants you to look, act, talk, be like him and be at peace just like he is. Jesus said, my peace I give to you. Then goes on to say, don't give any offense either to the Jews or to the nations, it says Greeks, but it means all the other nations, the ones that don't have any covenant at all, or to the church of God. We're not supposed to give offense to each other. You know, sometimes the church is, Satan wants us to be the most offended people on the face of the earth. Why? So that we won't walk in love, which is where the power is. And how do you not give offense? The world thinks we're offensive just because how we believe. We're not. We love them. Don't go play out in the street in front of those trucks. Don't take that. It's love. It's not being offensive. To, uh, to be offensive would to not tell them the truth in love. That, because they'd send them right to hell. That's horrible. I don't want to be responsible for that. But to really love them, like Jesus, he said some harsh things to the scribes and Pharisees, but he did it out of love. And I believe that some of them said, do I really look like a whitewashed sepulcher? Let me go to the Word and see. Oh, I do. Let me repent. And they could have been some of the main ones that got born again on the day of Pentecost. Because when God says something, and when he says something through you to somebody else, now people will have a chance. Remember, they were offended at Jesus enough to crucify him. But Jesus did what the Father told him to do. That's how we're supposed to be. Don't worry what people think. 
Be concerned what God thinks. I'm a God pleaser, not a man pleaser. First, I'm a God pleaser. And I'll tell you what, if I please God, and don't worry about what men think, he can use that more than if I'm always trying to please somebody. That's what got our country in such a mess. Trying to please everybody instead of pleasing God. Okay, another one of my favorite scriptures is 2 Timothy 2.15. The first one I ever memorized that my parents gave to me, my first Bible. It says, in the King James, it says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. As the pastor says, if you can rightly divide it, you can wrongly divide it. But it's a study. That word study in the Greek, actually it means to use speed to show yourself approved to God. Um, to make effort to show yourself approved to God. To be prompt or earnest. To, do, to give diligence. Be diligent. Endeavor, labor, and study. So it's a choice to be, yes, I'm going to be a doer. I'm going to rightly divide this word so that I get that pleases God, like the tithe, and he'll bless you for it. Then James 1, 19 and 20 says, So then, my beloved brethren, this is to the church. This is to you. This is what God expects you to be a doer of, not the Jews and not the nations. You can't expect somebody who doesn't know Jesus to understand this. They're not born again. But you do. You should be able to receive it and understand it. And there's nobody too young or too old that can't be a doer of the word. Because the Holy Spirit's in you. And he will guide you and help you. So James 1, 19 and 20 says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. And can you imagine as a church, they're out there making fun of us, saying they're going to tear, you know, whatever, saying all these things against the church or whatever we're doing and saying we're old-fashioned or whatever. Our job is just to be, we can hear what they're saying, but be swift to hear what the Lord says. Slow to speak, don't respond immediately, and slow to wrath. And they, you know what they'll see on you? Peace. What's different? We've got the Holy Spirit. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. All this stuff going out there in the streets and this anger on Facebook, it doesn't produce the righteousness of God, the goodness of God, his right standing. It's just causing more chaos. And it causes stress in their lives. The people behind it. The people that are following the lies. James 1, 21, therefore lay aside, now here's to the church, you, you're here tonight and watching on the line. God is saying it's time for real. It's not just words written here. This is God speaking to you through his word. Therefore lay aside all filthiness. You know what it means. It means the body language and everything. All filthiness and overflow of wickedness. And receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Well, your spirit's been born again and saved because you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But your soul needs to be renewed. Your mind, your will, your intellect, and your emotions. They need to be renewed every day through the word. And he said, receive the word in meekness. The implanted word, it's implanted in you. And it'll save, it'll keep you from getting all emotional or crazy or you know as my husband will tell you he's he now I didn't have very many faults except for the main one was quick to anger and it would make the whole house shake but I would feel better <laughs> they're all going nah, 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 for weeks afterwards right Larry <laughs> but you know that wasn't good I'm slow to anger the word says be slow to anger I take authority over it and it you know but, it says, but be doers of the word. You do what the word tells you to do. In other words, you stop being, having, being filthy and overflow of wickedness and justifying it. Okay? Just stop it. 
God gives you. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. When you only hear the word and think, oh, I've gone to church. Listen, I know of a lot of church people that gone to church their whole life. And they think because they went to church that they're okay with the Lord. They might be born again, but I'm telling you, they're deceiving themselves. And when it comes to all this anger and junk we're seeing and all this hostility out there, they get emotionally scared. They get in fear. They get riled up. They get angry because they've been deceived. They deceive themselves by not being a doer of the light of the word that God gave them. And everybody in here knows what I'm talking about. I've got a different word that maybe God has has enlightened me in. And I know that I know. It just kind of jumps out at you. And you think, oh, I get that word. And then he starts working with you on it. And he might be working with somebody else on something else. But it's that that he gives you. You trust him to perfect you in that word. Okay, then in Luke, we're going to have lots of scriptures tonight. Because God says it better than Luke 21, 29. Oh, this is, so we're going to be a doer of the word tonight in this respect. One of my favorite scriptures. Because um, the disciples were asking Jesus, when will the end time come? Then he spoke to them a parable, it says in Luke 21 and 29 and 30. And I have ministers all the time saying, oh, Rada. And it is all about Jesus. It is. But this whole word is Jesus. He said, I am the word. From beginning to end, this is God's plan. And so uh, they'll say, well, you don't need to be studying that Old Testament. You don't need to study Hebrew. But that's what God put in my heart. And I'm so glad he did because I'm seeing the wholeness of God's plan. It's so wonderful. Well, here's something that to be a doer of the word in Luke 21, 29, he said, then he spoke to them a parable. He said, look at the fig tree and all the trees. Well, this, this is a parable. Well, I'm not going to take time to go and prove it to you in the scriptures, okay? But it's in there. And sometime I will if we had time. But the fig tree represents Israel. And all the trees represent the nations of prophecy in the Bible that we're seeing right now on the news all the time. Um, It says, when they are already budding, you, church, Jesus is talking, you see and you know something. You see it and you know it by watching them. Know for yourself. That summer is now near, or the time of judgment, that's when he judged the harvest, is now near. Well, we're seeing this going on. Um, We're going to, most of those who study Bible prophecies believe we are on the brink of Ezekiel 38 and 39 war. Now, if who's ever in the back room, if you'd put up that map, I'm going to show you just so you have an idea of where we're talking about in the scriptures. We're seeing and knowing. And we're doing what Jesus said. When, see, just well, 2,000 years ago when Jesus spoke that, they didn't know, those disciples didn't know that 40 years later they were all going to be scattered all over the face of the earth and Israel wouldn't even exist, the fig tree. It'd just be desolate. It'd be barren. For 2,000 years, because the Jews did not listen to God, they did not obey, their punishment was they'd get scattered over the face of the earth. And, you know, now that they're coming back, there were pockets of Jews in every nation. China, every single nation you can think of, all over the place. And, uh, oh, I don't want to get sidetracked here. It's fun when you know some things, okay? But anyway, now he said, but in the last days, during the last days, I'm going to call them all back home. And, you know, I'm going to bring you back to where the land that I gave you. There are certain lands that he gave to the Jews. In Acts chapter 17, we won't go there, but it says that God predestined all the boundaries of the different nations of the earth. You know, and he predestined the United States to be here and our boundaries. Well, he gave Israel certain boundaries and he's given all the Palestinians certain boundaries. They just need to get in their own boundary, right? And, and the Arabs, oh my goodness. Okay, let's look up which map. Did they get any of the maps up there? I'd like for you to have the one with a big Egypt on it. Huh? Okay, see that one? So you guys can see it pretty good. Fair. But you see right up here, Egypt is green, and there's a little yellow spot in between those two green things. That's how big Israel is compared to Egypt is an Arabic nation. Saudi Arabia, look at all the land Saudi Arabia has. 
Look at Iraq, Iran up there, Syria, the other green place, that um, sort of odd color one next to that yellow, which is Israel, is Jordan. And up above Israel would be Lebanon. And then up above that is Turkey. So you see how big the nations are? And they're thinking, well, if Israel just gives up more land, there'll be peace on the earth. This is about as ridiculous. I mean, your head doesn't even make sense with it. Oh, you've got to give up some more land, so we'll have peace in the whole earth. And they've got the land that Israel has is only the size of New Jersey. <laughs> it doesn't even make common sense. How could grown adult politicians really think that's for real? I mean, the, the, the Muslims, all those other nations up there, the biggest nation of Muslims is Indonesia. We don't even have it up there. They've got more than enough land. <laughs> okay, but God, see what it is? Satan is wanting everybody to go against God. Satan, he wants to destroy what God has written so that he can be king, but it won't happen. Okay, so you can see where Iran is up there. Right now, Iran is really in the news. Iraq, that was through, um, that was where the terror babble was, but they kind of got taken out too long ago. Iran now is sending weapons over to this green Syria. And right next down to that little itty, right above the yellow Israel, and there's kind of a little brown spot, which is Lebanon. Right next to that, I don't know if you can see it, is Damascus. It's right there on the border. When Larry and I go to Israel, we go up there on the edge of the border, and you can see right over almost to Damascus. There's a little town in between that you see first. So, but it's right there, okay? And then the Golan Heights are right there. Then Jordan. So you see all that land. But you need to know what's going on in Syria because Iran, which in Bible times is Persia, is sending weapons over to Damascus. And it, because of weapons of, of nuclear weapons, things to do nuclear warfare. And this is what Iran says, Persia, Iran. They're saying as soon as we can take Israel out, because they're the frontliners of the United States. They're the little Satan. The United States is the big Satan. That's what they believe. Their job is to take Israel out so they can come after us. Right? Phil, that's the truth. They, they tell it all the time on their news. They're not, they say this is what our... Because they believe their imam, Allah, has told them to do that. And right now, I probably... I hope somebody's got to watch the time for me because I'll get too carried away. What I have to say tonight will be what the Lord wants me to say to you, though, if I don't get through my notes. But right now, what, okay, go to the next map, if they can, back there. Thank you. That shows, see, if you go, see, there's a big black line in the middle of it, and straight up from the bottom from Israel is Jerusalem, and straight up is, is a Moscow, Russia. Okay, that you can see there from, you've got Iran over there, and you see Turkey, and over here, let me see, Ukraine. So you've got Russia and Ukraine. That's where this war is going on right now. So anyway, in the meantime, while Russia is going against Ukraine, which I can't get into all of it, but again, God's word is God's word. He says, you'll bring judgment onto yourselves if you don't treat the Jews right. Anti-Semitism, you've got, if you've got any of it, repent. Because God loves the Jews and he separated them for a purpose and you don't want to touch the apple of his eye. What he does with them is between him and them. And we don't have a right to tell God you shouldn't treat those Jews that way. The purpose of the Jews originally in Israel was for all the other nations before, church, before Christianity came along was for them to see this nation that God blessed. And they could see it with their eyes. They're prosperous. They walk in health. They worship one true God. And I'm for them. And I fight their battles for them. And they were supposed to see that so that they would all come to God. And be like them. He said, if you would just come to me and repent, this is what my plan. I'm a good dad. But they all wanted to do it their own way. And so anyway... Um, then the Jews decided way back when, before Christendom, they decided, well, we don't want to be so different anymore. We don't want to be special anymore. We want to be like all the other nations because they look at us and they make fun of us because we wear, we are modest in our clothing and we don't worship idols. 
We obey the law of God and we love him with all our heart, soul, and mind. We teach our children about God. But all the other nations, they were doing their own thing and made fun of them and laughed at them. So they decided, I want to be like them just a little bit. God will understand if I take this little idol into the temple with me so that my neighbors will know that I appreciate them and like their God. <laughs> God said, that's not the deal, kids. You're going to go on a timeout for 2,000 years. God had a plan, I know, scattered. And then, of course, Jesus came, and then those of us who got born again from every nation and tongue, then we're a part of the body of the anointed one. We say Christ, but that word really means Messiah, and it means the anointed one. We could say, you know, um, oh, some of the scriptures that we say, Jesus Christ our Lord, it should be Jesus the anointed one our Lord, or Jesus the Messiah, our Lord, but he's the anointed one that lives in me. Yeah, and when he moved inside of you, the anointing moved inside of you, the anointed one and his anointing, which was to do what the song was, heal the sick, I've got a river of life flowing out of me, to do these things, what the church is supposed to do, and it's supposed to be seen, and we're supposed to be prosperous. And seen doesn't mean you have to have be a billionaire and just have everything. No, it means you're prosperous. That means you have your bills paid, you have your health, you can take your kids on vacation, a decent vacation, and have all your bills paid and live a happy life. That's prosperity. I, we knew a lot of people in the boat business that had lots of big boats, and they were in debt over their head, and they looked like they had a lot, and they did have a lot of money, but they weren't happy. And then we saw some that had a lot of money and they were happy because they knew him. It goes both ways, okay? So, this is, so you see here, right now what's happened is you go back over to here, up here on this map. Turkey, or I mean Iran, which was Persia when we get into that, has been sending weapons over to Damascus. So then Russia starts a war with Ukraine and they're beginning to lose some of Russia's beginning to get depleted on their, their economy. So Israel knew that these weapons were coming, and so Russia said, if you start bombing the weapons that are, they're bringing over to Turkey that's out to kill you, then you're gonna, we're going to fight with Iran, okay? But then they got in this thing with Ukraine. So Russia said, okay, Israel, we won't stop if you want to bomb some of the things here in, in close to Damascus. As long as you will not fight for the Ukraine against us. Because <laughs> Israel's got the greatest army of all, that itty-bitty itty -bitty nation. They are amazing. But anyway, last week, I guess Russia got mad at Israel again, and I don't know what's going on there. But you kind of see an idea of what's going on. Now, you see where the players are in this. Now, go back to the scriptures that we're looking on. This Ezekiel 38 and 39 war, I'm going to look at Isaiah 17 first because it all goes together with um, Bible prophecy. I just want you to know when you start seeing some things happening or you even see preachers talking about it, don't get into fear. Do not, God said over and over and over, do not fear. Do not fear. If you're walking in the love of God, perfect love casts out all fear. If you, I'm not you know, I started getting in fear when I, before I came down here to speak because it seemed like everything it was, I hadn't had anything to eat. I didn't know what I wanted to eat, you know, and then I get a phone call and da-da-da. And, and the very thing I'm teaching, what happens? The enemy will try to bring fear to you. But this is where I've got it indwelled in me. Okay, Loretta, straighten up. No fear. Do not fear. And I'm saying that to you too. Okay, in Isaiah 17.1, this is something that we haven't seen yet. And this is a word from the Lord about the end times. It says, the burden against Damascus. Remember where I showed Damascus was in Syria right there? Now, Syria right now is almost not even a nation anymore because Iran has taken over. The terrorists have taken over it and Lebanon. It's really a state of, Syria, of Iran you know, more than, that's just what's going on. And so it says, the burden against Damascus, behold, Damascus will cease from being a city and it will be a ruinous heap. Some say like 
Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, Damascus is one of the oldest cities on the face of the earth, and it's been around forever. That's where Paul was on the road to Damascus when he saw the light. I mean, it's been around there. For God to say, it's become a ruinous heap, a heap is going to cease to exist. We have known that for years and years. Helen Sutton used to say, the first thing you're going to see is Damascus is going to get destroyed before you see some of the other Bible prophecy being fulfilled. We're watching it. They're bombing all, I, I don't even know, we don't even for sure if it's still really standing. There's not much left of it because it's being bombed all over the place. It's possible that if Iran does send a missile over, it'll, God will say, stop, and it'll land on Damascus and poof, they will cease to be a city because he's going to stop her from going to Israel. Okay, but he said this would happen. Then later on in Isaiah 17, 12, it says, Woe to the multitude of many people. That's all the many peoples over there saying, we're going to put Israel into the sea. I'm going to say something. I'm going to go back because this is going on right now. The imams of, of, of the Muslims, of, oh, what do you, it's not really Muslims. What is their religion? Islam, of Islam. They say that they've run across, they've ran across a very old prophecy. And in this prophecy from their Allah, it says that Israel will be pushed in the sea. Well, we know that's not true because God wrote this book and he said it'll never cease to exist. But it said that they believe it's going to happen in the month of July. So now they're saying through all their minarets and their prayer things, you know, it's time for us to push Israel into the sea. And if we push Israel into the sea and kill all of them, then it'll make Allah happy. You know, that's what they really, they do not have, um, they don't honor life at all. That's why they send, bomb, you know, people that will explode themselves and stuff like that. And so they believe that for this month. And that's why we're seeing some of this stirring up. And Israel's gotten on guard. And they've got all their military out there because they know that Persia is saying this and all of the Islamists around them are saying, yay, it's time. Okay. But anyway, it says, woe to the multitude of many people who make it noise, a noise like the roar of the seas and to the rushing of nations. That's not the church or the Jews. It's the nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. The nations will rush like the rushing of many waters, but God will rebuke them and they will flee far away and be chased like the chaff of the mountains before the wind, like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. Verse 14, then behold, in the evening at eventide, trouble. Now, some of the Bible prophecies, we don't know for sure, I'm telling you, you see things as they begin to happen. You can speculate. You see more after it happens. Oh, that's what God meant. Right? But God will show you things to come. And you start getting a glimpse. And you can't say it is going to be. Because God's got the details. Okay? But it says, then behold, in the evening, trouble. And before the morning, he is no more. Talking about the enemy against Israel. This is the portion of those who plunder us, Israel. And the lot of those who rob us, they're going to come against them like a mighty rushing wind. And they won't be anymore. So now, we're going to look at Ezekiel 38, 39. Um, I don't know. I told them just to have it ready. I didn't give them certain verses because I knew we didn't have a lot of time to go over it detail by detail. But I'm going to highlight some things for you. Ezekiel 37, I'm going to just read one verse in here. They don't have it back there. But it says in verse 26, Moreover, God is speaking, I will make a covenant of peace with them, Israel, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. He's going to make peace with Israel, with Jews, and it's going to be everlasting. Doesn't mean they're born again. Okay, I don't want to get into that now, but I will establish them and multiply them and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. That's the future. God shows you things to come in his word. Look at verse 28. The nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. He's got a plan for Israel. He's got a plan for us too. We're the church. 
We get to be his trophies of grace for eternity. We get to rule and reign with him over the earth. We've got a good, good future. Okay, now let's look at Ezekiel 38, this war that everybody was talking about. Now, the word of the Lord came to me saying, to Ezekiel, Son of man, Ben Adam, <laughs> that's what it says in Hebrew, I like that, Ben Adam. Ben means son, Adam. Ben, son of man, Ben Adam, set your face against Gog. Now, we believe, Bible prophets, and what we believe is that Gog is the evil spirit that rules through men. Just like in Daniel, I don't know how many of you know your Bibles, but there's a place where Daniel was praying. And so the angel went to give Daniel the answer, but he had to war, uh, the Michael had to war against the princess over, which, which nation was it? Was it Persia? It was Persia, Iran. Okay, so they, we know that there's evil spirits that operate through men in the leaderships of men. When God comes against nations, he's not going to hurt every single person. It's the leaderships and how you vote. You will be responsible in our nation. But he goes against the leaders, not against the individual people that have been caught in that evil regime. He knows their hearts, let's put it that way. Set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, which we believe is Russia, the prince of Rosh, or that's Russia, Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against, not them, but against him. Prophesy against the evil spirit. Okay? But now people have to let him operate through them. They have a freedom of choice. So they, people will get caught up in it. Okay. And say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. He's against that evil spirit. We can rejoice over that word, right? I will turn you around and put hooks into your jaws and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them hand handling swords. In other words, he's going to call these people out in a military army type thing. And he says, um, and he mentions Persia, that's Iran. Ethiopia, it says in my Bible, is Cush, but it means in that area. And Libya, in that area. There's different words and people translated to English trying to, but they had, it's just in that area. You can't say that exact nation. Are with him, all of them with shield and buckler. So a whole lot of people are going to fight with Russia. Because they want Israel gone. And they want the United States gone. Gomer and all his troops, some say that could be parts of Germany. Anyway, it's in Europe. The house of Togarma, that's parts of Turkey. From the far north and all his troops, many people are with you, Gog. Many people are deciding to follow Satan because they don't read this word. Prepare yourself and be ready. Then in verse 8 it says, Ezekiel 38, 8. Now, this tells you the time when all this prophecy is going to happen. After many days, you will be visited in the latter years. That's where we're living now. In the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long, which had long been desolate. That didn't happen until 1940. Eight. Israel's been desolate. It's been a waste place. They were all scattered for 2,000 years. And God said at this time, when he calls the people back, and it re-inhabits it. I mean, there are so many Jews. We started going there, I don't know what year, 2000, um, right after 9-11. It was the first time we went. And now I've been back, and I, it's shocking how many people live there now, how many Jews have moved in. They're just coming from all over the world. And after this Ukraine thing, a whole bunch of them came from Ukraine. And a whole bunch of them came from Russia. Now they're, why? Because God is, the Bible says he pipes for them. Come home, come home. And I'm going to give you an illustration that David Barron did, a Jew that wrote in the early 1900s and became a Christian. But he, he, said, he said the way that is, he went on a camping trip. And I love this. And they were all sitting around there. And a shepherd came up with all of his sheep. And sat down and talked with him by the fire. And so they were all talking and everything. And his sheep started, you know, just wandering around behind rocks and everything like that. And they were talking and just visiting with his shepherd. And then the shepherd said, well, I must go now. And he stood up. He reached in his, in his robe type of thing. And he pulled out a pipe. 
and he started piping a little tune, and all the sheep just, and they followed that tune. And that's what God is piping for the Jews. He's, he's making a sound in their hearts. Come home. It's time. Come home. And they may not even know why. I've talked to Jews over there. I don't know why I'm here, but I have to be here. And a lot of the Jews today are agnostics because of the Holocaust. And they're not born again. But there's a covenant with them. Now, how God works it all out, I'm not going to... It's God. It's God. Okay? I'm not saying they're born again just because they're Jews. I don't believe in that. I believe God know Jesus. But he's, Jesus is going to reveal himself to them. That's the key. But he said, Latter years who will come to the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations. And now all of them dwell safely. And I won't read all of it, but people say, well, they don't. They're not safe. There's wars going all around. And it says they want to have walled cities. Well, they don't have walled cities. You could go from village to village to village, and there's not any walls around them. But when Ezekiel wrote this, every single little town, every single little village had to have walls around it because they didn't have airplanes, and they didn't have... They, that's the only defense they had. And so every town, every little Berg that you're in. They built walls around everything. So they'd be... Now they don't. They just travel around Israel like we do here in the United States. Are they dwelling safely? The Jews pre feel pretty safe there. Number one, they know God's on their side. And number two, they've got some of the best military in the whole world. And they know it. And we know it. And I know when we go, you feel safer there than you do any place on the face of the earth. Right, Larry? Right, Phil? How many of you have been to Israel? You talk about, you should feel like fear, you think. And there's no fear, because you're in the will of the Lord. It is the most amazing feeling. You know? So anyway, it's a good thing. Um, in verse 11, it says, You will say, they will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people. They are a peaceful people. Who dwell safely. They are dwelling safely in there. Just like we are here. You know. All of them dwelling without walls. And having neither bars nor gates. And what's their purpose? Their purpose is to take plunder. And to take booty. To stretch out our hand against the waste places. That are again inhabited. And against a people gathered from the nations. Who have acquired livestock and goods. Who dwell in the midst of the land. It's talking about today. Now we think right now the hook that maybe God is going to use, they just discovered in Israel the largest, um, the largest uh, natural gas in the world. They've got all this natural gas. Well, so now we've got Russia, and they're beginning to have a bad economy. They may be being pulled down because they want to take the booty. They want to, Israel is a prosperous nation, Okay. And then it goes on some other nations here. And Hilton, Sutton, or Lester, somewhere on one of them said, this is the news media that comes along and says, what are, you, what are you doing, Russia? And all you other nations, Turkey and everybody, what are you doing? Going to take their spoil? Let's make a report on it. That's just a joke. But, you know, they come and say, what are you doing? Verse 14, therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, remember, he's evil spirit. Thus said the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on military, we could say. You will come against my people. Israel, verse 16, like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days. He tells us when it's going to be. We need to know the plan. We have no excuse to not know the plan. So let's look at verse 17. Thus says the Lord God, are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied your years in those days, and I would bring you against them? Then it goes into the judgments of Gog. So let's go down to verse 22. And I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him on his troops. See, they're going to come over Israel, the mountains of Israel, like probably in plains, and thanks all of these military people. But he's God said, I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus, God said, 
I will magnify myself and sing to myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the one true God. And it says in Job that he's got a storehouse full of hailstones. So, you know, all of a sudden, I mean, this is what I think. If we do see this Ezekiel war, and it looks like we might while we're here, then if for the nations to see, know that he's God, he's going to have to start doing some things like, like he did for Israel in the old days, parting the Red Sea. Um, and then the enemy goes in and they all get drowned. He feeds them with manna. He protects them. They have fire. I mean, even it's miraculous the things he did for them, the plagues of Egypt, but it didn't touch the Jews. And God was saying, I want you to know I'm the really one true God. Just repent. But I'm going to take care of my children. Right? So that's what I kind of think. If we see it, be watching for miracles. I know the Six-Day War, I don't know if you've ever read, seen the documentary. It's called um, Against All Odds. If you haven't seen it, it's good to get it. It shows some of the, it showed some of the battles that they did in the Six-Day War and the documentary things that, like one, the Israel knew that they had gone in a, a field that had mines all over it, but it's desert over there, so there's sand. And they were praying to God, and all of a sudden a big wind came, and it blew the sand away, and they could see all the landmines, and they marched right through modern day miracles like that and there was just a whole bunch of them that they told about so anyway I think we might be seeing something like that have a, um, 39 verse 1 and you son of man prophesy against Gog and say thus is the Lord God behold I am against you O Gog the prince of Rosh Meshach and Tubal and I will turn you around and lead you on bringing you up from the far north and bring you against the mountains of Israel then I will knock the bow out of your left hand and cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and the people who are with you. I will give you to the birds of prey every sort and of the beasts of the field to be devoured because of their flesh. Israel can't have dead flesh, so God has these birds come and clean up the dead flesh. They've got to cleanse the land. And I'm going to go on down to seven. All this is good, but I just give you some highlights. Then God said, this is a purpose in this. The purpose is so I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. Then the nations shall know, even the United States, shall know that he's God. I'm the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. How they profaned his name is when they left Israel when he said this land belongs to them, and they left, and he was going to make them, you know, prosperous and everything. That was profaning his very name, his character, and his reputation, because he said, I give this land to you. But they had to be scattered, because if he's told them, if you don't listen, I will scatter you. But now he's going to bring them back, and he's going to say, now the nations, and you know what's going to happen? The nations have a choice. Oh, he really is the one true God. Or they'll say, I don't care. I'm going to fight against him. Um, verse 18. Surely it is coming and it shall be done, says the Lord God, that this is the day of which I have spoken. Then those who dwell in the cities of Israel go out and set on fire all of the weapons and things like that for seven years. Then go over to 12. And for seven months, the house of Israel had to be burying the ones that are dead. And it goes on. Let's go on down to... Verse 21, Ezekiel 39, 21. He said, I, God is speaking, will set my glory among the nations. Glory. His, his glory is his manifested presence. He said, I will set my manifested presence among the nations. All the nations shall see my judgment, which I have executed. And my hand which I have laid on them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. See, they're right now some of them are agnostic, like I said, because of the Holocaust. They're going to know, oh no, God still loves us. He's fighting for us. You really are our God. And they'll know when they see him move on their behalf. Okay, verse 25. Therefore, thus is the Lord God. Now I will bring back the captives of Jacob, that's the earth flesh Jews, and have mercy 
on the whole house of Israel, and I will be jealous for my holy name. And then in verse 27, when I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and I am hallowed in them, them in the sight of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back to their land and left none of them captive any longer. In other words, the whole Holocaust situation, God's vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And he will repay. It's not ours, okay? Verse 29, and I will not. This is God speaking. He cannot lie. I will not hide my face from them, Israel, the Jews, anymore. For I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. And then it goes on into the millennial temple. But I just want you to know, if there's a, there's a lot of anti-Semitism out there in the church, in the Word of Faith churches, in every place. Sometimes it'll rise up in me because Satan wants it to. And if, if I get it once in a while, I love the Jews. I think I was born loving the Jews. It was a God call. But fight against it because God loves them. He's got a plan for them. Now we're going to, after you kind of see what might be happening in our time, then let's look at what he says to the church. We saw what's going to happen to Israel. We saw what's going to happen to the nations in this. Now let's see what he says to the church. First of all, he says, do not fear. And I'm saying, walk in his love that has been shed or brought in your heart by the Holy Spirit. Perfect love casts out all fear. Acts 9.31. Acts 9.31. Then the churches, this is what happened in the beginning of the church. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. If we want to see more souls into the kingdom of God, got to do this, be a doer of the word. Have peace, edify each other, walk in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, then you'll see people added to us. Not being like them. Not getting in a fight with them on Facebook or any place. Not getting in an argument. Just being at peace. Romans 8.15, church. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. See, those, they're in bondage to fear. It's a bondage. It's a, you talk about slave mentality, slaves. They're slaves to fear. You know, you know, like the black lives matter. Of course black lives matter. Every life matters. <laughs> I mean, you know. I mean, but it's a fear of being a slave. And every culture is a, is a slave to Satan, to sin, to fear. Unless you get born again and believe his word. Then like I say, no matter what culture you are, whatever nation you're from, then all of a sudden you become citizens in heaven. And we all equally have citizen, heavenly citizen rights. Not a one of us have any different. There's not, what do they call it? Huh? There's not, yeah, there's no classes and there's no um, white supremacy or black supremacy. No, we're one in him. And we have, we have the rights of heaven. So he's supreme. And we're all one, and we love each other, and we like each other's cultures. I mean, because, you know, part of what God created, he's, he's not a blank God. I mean, that'd be like, well, every flower's got to be yellow. Otherwise, we can't accept it. No matter how good it smells, it's not yellow. <laughs> how stupid it gets, right? Okay, Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father. He's like a dad to us. Abba. And he's a good father. He loves us. Oh, here's something else I want to say for the nation, for you church right now. There's, you know, the economy looks like it's getting pretty bad. Okay? And they're saying that we're going to have a huge recession. They are saying. Fear is saying we're going to have a huge recession. Um. <laughs> Well, I do know this. Um, I, I know somebody who's a good Christian that told me that and has some money and said, uh, you need to pray about taking your money out of the banks right now because of what's coming down. And she was told by the Lord to do it. 
I prayed, and the Lord said, no, don't worry about it. Well, Max, you know, Max, the guy up in, the guy who came here, he had a dream. He was, woke up the other night, about two nights ago, three nights ago, and at three o'clock in the morning, and he woke up, and the Lord said, you got to pray for the economy. Tell them to pray for the economy. Psalm 2111. So we looked up Psalm 2111. It says, for they intended evil against you. That's capital U, God. Evil against God. They devised a plan which they are not able to perform. <laughs> Glory, <laughs> hallelujah. Praise God. See, God told us they can't. They're dividing a plan to take this country down, to bankrupt us, to bankrupt the church, everything. But if God is for you, who can be against you? And the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. And I will say this, I pray, if the Lord tells you to take your money to the bank, take it out. If he doesn't tell you to, then don't. Just don't do anything in fear. Do everything out of peace. And like we were talking to Mary Helen earlier, it's by your own faith. I might have faith to leave my money in, and you might have faith to take your money out. But don't judge each other over it. Love each other. Encourage each other, okay? But anyway, they devise a plot. Inside that, the Bible says the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. And he provides for all of us. So don't worry. No fear. Fear, if fear gets into you, that's where the enemy has got a foothold. James 1, 5 and 6 says, if any of you, and Billy said, do this for your finances too, your money. If any of you lacks wisdom about what you should do about money, where you live, where you should go, anything, ask of God, just ask him, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. In other words, he's not gonna, he's not gonna chastise you because you asked him for his wisdom. He gives it to you liberally and it will be given to you if you just ask him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like the wave of the sea, etc. So we just have, God, I ask you to give me wisdom on what to do for my money. And then he'll tell you something. And then you believe it. Don't doubt. That's what I, and the Lord will say, Loretta, you're doubting. <laughs> oh, no, no, Lord, you tell me that. Okay, I believe it. Because I got peace. When he speaks, you have this, this warm, fuzzy feeling. Okay, and then 2 Corinthians 7 1 church, I'm speaking to church. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. What does the word holiness mean? You're separated to him. Holy means you're separated to him. You're different than the world. We walk in love and we walk in wisdom. We walk in joy and peace, okay? But you have to get rid of filthiness. You can't be like the world. 2 Timothy 1, seven. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's a good one to speak if you start having at my age. I say, am I getting dementia like my mother? No, God didn't give me the spirit of fear about dementia, but he gave me the spirit of power over all the works of the devil. And he gave me the spirit of love, and he gave me the spirit of a sound mind. I've got to, you've got to believe it and receive the engrafted word, what we said earlier. Speak it to the church again, Mark 16, 14. Later he appeared to the 11. Oh, I, I thought this, this is for us. Later he appeared, it all is, but later he appeared to the 11 as they sat at the table, Jesus, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart. So he could say, I rebuke your unbelief and your hardness of heart. Because they did not believe, he rebuked them did not believe those who had seen him after he had arisen. Verse 15, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. I've got a river of life flowing. <laughs> in my name, they will cast out demons. In my name, they will speak in new tongues. In my name, they will take up serpents, or that's just anything the enemy does. And if they drink anything deadly, COVID, if you took the shot, oh no, it can't. You just got to believe it's not going to harm you. Or if you didn't take the shot, if you breathed it, if you drink it, you, didn't, you ingested it, right? If you believe this, it's not going to harm you, Okay. Um, it will by no means hurt them. 
They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. It doesn't say they will immediately, but they will recover. God does the work. All you have to do is do the laying hands and the believing, and he does the work. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. That's for the church today. Um, we don't have to go so far to the whole world to preach. We've got Muslims in our nation. We've got Mexicans in our nation. We've got every ethnic group. You can think Somalians. Chinese, Japanese, we are a melting pot of all the nations. And that's why we don't have to go very far to pre to let's start just being the church in our own neighborhood. Right? Then Ephesians 5:15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Circumspectly means see that you walk sing all around, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand it. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit of God. He's love. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. It doesn't say, oh, get down and out and whiny. It doesn't say that at all, does it? He wants you to, even in the middle of trouble, because when you're whining, you don't, you're not in faith. But when you're singing and singing melody and singing to the Lord, which Ryan and James and what was the other one in your band that's up there with Robbie? What was his name? Um, huh? The one that was in your band. I can't, couldn't hear you. Okay. That he's already moved to heaven. Yeah, okay. And anyway, I was thinking the other day, I was thinking, I wonder if Robbie's joining us with our singing down here. And the Lord said, when we're praising, you guys were praising. He said, oh, no, you guys are joining him, praising me. <laughs> He's not joining us, we're joining him. <laughs> and the Lord, and I know I'm going off. It's almost time to leave. I, but, you know, I, oh, I just love God so much. But I was kind of, at first, when he first passed away, the Lord was really giving me little glimpses of Robbie in heaven and comforting me by the Holy Spirit, showing me some things. And then I was just kind of lifted. And all of a sudden, it was just blank. And I know he is there, and I know he's with God. I believe the word. I don't have to see it to believe it. But I kind of miss God comforting me. And the other day, I was just going to tell you guys this, because for one thing, I know that at the very beginning, he showed me this instrument. I call it a guitar, but it wasn't a guitar. It made some kind of a music, and it had, a, it had some kind of a neck on it, and he was going to strum it. But it wasn't like a, anything we've seen. And I can't explain it. But the Lord said, once he hears the sound that comes out of that, it's special made for him, handmade just for Robbie. And they gave it to him. He said, once he hears the sound of that, he's not coming back. I said, God, that's not fair. But, <laughs> but I'm so glad. Well, then I was thinking, Robbie never, it was because after you told me he went down to see the house that he grew up in. I thought he never really had a home after he left home. He just had... You know, I never had a real home. And I was feeling bad for my son. And the Lord said, yeah, but Loretta, I said, I go to pl prepare a place for him. And when I was thinking of it, oh, I wonder what Robbie's house looks like. And then I was thinking, well, they say it's rooms. I go to prepare a room for him. What is a room in God's house? Well, it'd be wonderful. And I feel like the Lord said to me, it doesn't say a room. I said, I go to prepare room for Robbie. And who he is and what he's to be. He's preparing a room for each one of you out there. Room for you and who you are created to be. And for he's creating you to do your Derek up there on earth. I mean up there in heaven for eternity. Room just for everything that he has planned for you, Ryan. He made room for that. And he's got big plans. Bigger than we can think for all of us. And then I said, oh, I can see Robbie now. As soon as you guys get there, come on over. We're going to jam. See my, and I really believe that. There's no doubt. And God shows you things to come. Okay, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Um, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now, Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Righteous right hand. He upholds us. You've got to believe it and receive it. Take it. Deuteronomy 31 8 says, And the Lord, He is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed in these evil days. Know His word. So be doers of the word. Walk, act, be, shine forth His love, speak His truth. Be an excellent ambassador of the kingdom of God. And remember, Brother Hagin's quote, the word you rejoice over is a word that will work for you. Amen and amen and amen. <laughs> okay. Hallelujah. I hope you guys got something out of this. And I hope it helped you to know no fear. Look at the look. I like to see the girl. I used to teach grade school. For you to clap, that makes my heart happy. <laughs> That's you, right? I love, you know, I relate better to kids than you adults. You kind of, you don't scare me because God lives in me. <laughs> I love you.